people of God, welcome home. Welcome home to worship here at Central Presbyterian Church. Let us now center our hearts and our minds on the worship of God with the gift of our music. Once again, welcome here to worship at Central Presbyterian Church. Welcome to all of you who are gathered here physically in the sanctuary, as well as all of you who are gathered with us online. If you are here in the sanctuary during our offering, we will be passing those red friendship folders. If we don't have your contact information, would you please provide that so I can make my words of welcome more personal to you in the coming weeks? And if you have a change of address, also please let us know that too. I have just a couple of announcements this morning, but don't get used to it. I can't promise this will be a pattern. First, uh, next Sunday is the very first Sunday in Advent, and after worship we are going to be having an Advent lunch and celebration and gathering. All of you, all are welcome to that event. Uh, if you want to eat lunch, we do need to know that, so if you would make a reservation using the Realm um, app or on your website, or you can call the church office and just let us know. We simply want to make sure that all can be fed. The second thing that I would like to just announce is a moment of personal privilege, and I believe Betty Rose is traveling today or worshiping with us online, but I want to say out loud a thank you to her for once again providing the artwork for our Advent, um, for our Advent issue of Central Magazine. So she has been doing this as a stewardship of her gift gifts for us at least the last two times, and I've only been here through two of them, so it's probably a lot more than that. But we are grateful that she uses those creative gifts in that way. So next time you see her, please make sure to thank her for that. So now as the tower bell rings, may it call out to the city and to the world that Central Presbyterian Church is worshiping God.
Friends, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as you feel led for our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is she who made us, and we are hers. We are the people, the sheep of her pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God, bless his name. For the Lord is good, her steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness is from generation to generation. Let us worship God. says the Lord our God I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out the scattered sheep so I will seek out my people trusting that God is indeed seeking us let us confess our sin together using the words printed in our bulletin God you have called to us but we have not answered you have sought us out but we have continued to wander. You have tenderly gathered us together and cared for us, but we have not extended that same care and mercy to others. Forgive us, remind us, teach us, set us free from sin that we might turn toward your love and justice for the whole world. 
guide us so that tentative step after tentative step, we may walk your way. I invite you into a moment of silent confession. Amen. Friends, the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. God's love and presence is abundant here in this place and all around us. These waters here remind us of the ever-flowing free grace given to us again and again. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Having received forgiveness in the good news, let us share in God's love and grace with one another using signs and words of peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Friends, at this time, we invite our youngest worshipers forward for a time with children or for all who feel led and called. friends how are you all right friends so i have this crown have you all ever seen a crown before yes yes <laughs> who do you think wears a crown who do you think a king, a king? who do you think um, a crown with a, a queen mm-hmm Sometimes a queen wears a crown. Who do you y'all think? A king. A king. A king. They do. They do. Anybody else? Who do you think? Who wears a crown? God. Can God wear a crown? Do y'all know what today is called in the church calendar year? Today's got a really fancy name. Beginning of Advent. That's really close. So Advent starts next week. But today, in our church calendar year, sometimes we call this Sunday Christ the King Sunday. 
It's the last Sunday in our church calendar year. Have y'all ever heard of Jesus referred to as a king before? No? No? Well, sometimes our stories in the Bible tell us that Jesus is like the king of kings. And so sometimes we talk about God or Jesus in such a way. Does anybody want to wear the crown for me? I want to wear it. I see you eyeing it. Yeah. I love it. So today we celebrate this as our last Sunday in our liturgical year. And we celebrate the coming that is about to happen of Jesus during Advent. We're going to do a bunch of waiting. And at the end of it, Jesus, we will celebrate his birth. So friends, will you all pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the waiting of Advent. Thank you for this last Sunday in the year. Thank, Thank you, you for this, this last Sunday, Sunday in the Jesus. year. We are so excited to see what happens next. We are so, so excited, excited to, to see what, see what happens, happens next. next. Amen. 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 All right, friends, y'all can head back to your seat. You can get the crown. Oh, thank you. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first lesson for today is from Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 through 16 and 20 through 24. This passage is concerned with leadership, power, and authority, and uses the imagery of shepherds and sheep to address this. It is set within the time of exile. Israel's leaders have allowed the people to scatter and become prey. God judges these shepherds for their poor, inattentive, selfish leadership, which has fostered both a social and a theological crisis among the people. Listen now for the word of God. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among the scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of cloud and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down on good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them the one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Holy wisdom, holy word. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. I invite you to again listen for God's living word. And the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, 
Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then the king will say to those at his left hand, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Holy wisdom, holy word. As Courtney Ann has already told us today is the last Sunday of our Christian year, when we call Reign of Christ Sunday or Christ the King. In some Christian traditions, this is a feast day, a day of celebration and joy. So naturally, we're going to talk about judgment. Yay! What a better way to celebrate than that. This week, I was reminded that Christ the King Sunday was created just after World War I as a Christian response to the dangers of nationalism. The leadership of the Catholic Church was so dismayed by the horrors of the war and all of the violence, as well as by the total allegiance to country before God, that they decided the Christian Church had to take a stance against all of that. Thus, Christ the King Sunday came into being as a way to declare that the God we know in Jesus is the only one to whom we offer complete allegiance, not our political party, not our nation, not even our particular way of connecting to God. But as I reflected on that history, I could not help but conclude that the more things change, the more things stay the same. The idolatry of nationalism continues to run amok all these decades later. We see it every single day. We might even participate in it every single day to one degree or another. So perhaps hearing these texts from Ezekiel and Matthew is good for us, even though biblical texts about judgment are always a challenge. And yet biblical texts such as our readings for today have the chance to stop us in our routine and make us lift our heads. First, though, let's begin at the end. Both passages, though stark when first encountered, are inviting all of us to experience more deeply the justice-making love of God. In the words of William Sloan Coffin, of God's love, we can say two things. First, it is poured out universally for everyone, from the Pope to the loneliest person on the planet. Second, God's love doesn't seek value, it creates value. Indeed, in both Ezekiel and Matthew, we see a holy insistence that it is not because we've earned our value that we are loved by God. Rather, because we are loved by God, we have value. 
Our value as children of God is a gift and not some kind of earned credit. And that just by itself is a countercultural claim to hold on to, especially during the holidays. We first see a glimpse of God's holy insistence in the passage from Ezekiel. The prophet paints an image of God as the one who makes the first move by seeking us out, not the other way around. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. According to Ezekiel, we have become so lost and wandering that God must take the trouble to come and find and rescue us. And astonishingly, God is more than willing. The first brush strokes of Ezekiel's picture paint very good news. It is good news that God wants to find the sheep, feed them, wipe away their tears, bind up their wounds. It is good news that God wants to gather the sheep when they're lost and scattered. It is good news that God wants to take the sheep to a place where they can relax and be calm rather than fretfully run to and fro in a state of panic and fear. But then as Ezekiel continues to paint his picture, we begin to see a more complex image of God's holy insistence emerge. As a part of God's gracious shepherding, God also sorts the sheep. God separates the fat and strong sheep from the weak ones. Apparently, as God seeks and finds, she also judges as God the shepherd sorts out one from another. Does that stop you in your little sheep tracks? This is the judgment part of the text. Some of us, your preacher included, don't really like to talk about very much. And perhaps the reason we don't like to talk about God's judgment is because somewhere deep down we're kind of scared we might be found on the wrong side of things. Or like my experience with a childhood neighbor who at 10 years old condemned me to hell after I told her I didn't believe in it, perhaps we've also been told in no uncertain terms we will be on the wrong side of things when judgment occurs. So maybe it is our fear that keeps us from pondering this scene. But I also wonder, though, if the beating heart of the matter might be something else. What if our distaste about God's judgment stems not so much from a fear of being found on the wrong side, but rather what if our distaste comes from an undercurrent in our culture, an undercurrent that claims that when God judges, God is stepping onto our turf. Just listen to the news, read on the latest kerfuffle in Congress, pay attention to TikTok or to your Facebook feed, read the signs at all the variety of protests that crop up. So much of our rhetoric screams that we consider it our human prerogative, our human right to be the ones to label and to condemn, to sort, and to judge. The truth is that we all do it even those of us who claim to be non-judgmental, before we really see someone, and certainly before we decide whether or not we want to know their story, we want to first figure out where they are on the political spectrum or whose side they're taking in the current war between Israel and Hamas, or as is said here in the South that I learned when I was in seminary, who are their people? Only then, after we have properly judged and sorted the other based on whatever categories we deem important, do we decide to either invest our time in seeing and listening or not. Brother Ezekiel calls us on this folly. He says we are just ridiculous with all this, just ridiculous because we're all lost sheep, running to and fro, panicky in the dark storm. Furthermore, Ezekiel insists the acts of judging and sorting belong only to God. And apparently God's concerns are not always ours. 
We see this illustrated when God starts sorting, and it becomes clear that God is not trying to divide the pure sheep from the sinful sheep. God is not insisting on a litmus test based on political convictions or theological viewpoints or where one's from or the kind of family structure. No, according to the picture Ezekiel paints, the only thing that God is interested in seeing at the time of judgment is what the rest of the sheep seemingly refuse to say, who are the ones being left out? As God moves about the mountains, gathering all the sheep to bring them home, all the sheep to bring them home, God gets very particular about seeking out the weaker ones, ones who have lived their lives being butted around and battered about, being forgotten or just shoved aside. Ezekiel's picture of God's judgment is a picture of a holy shepherd who insists on being fiercely compassionate for all who have been wounded by the selfish or oppressive actions of others or institutional systems. A holy shepherd who insists on being fiercely protective of those as strong and influential have deemed weak and insignificant. A holy shepherd who insists on being fiercely determined to reveal the true value of those who've been humanly judged as not being worth anyone's time or energy. This is the strange sorting of the sheep in Ezekiel's story of God. This is what Ezekiel claims judgment looks like. It looks like a picture of God's holy insistence that all the sheep will receive love and justice, while pointing out that some of us, lost and weak sheep ourselves, continually get judgment all wrong. Matthew paints a similar kind of picture in his gospel. Like in Ezekiel, we see the paint strokes of holy insistence in Matthew's scene of judgment. In this scene, Jesus is king, sovereign, victorious over all creation and all the people, Furthermore, like the holy shepherd did in Ezekiel, Jesus is also going about the business of gathering and sorting and judging. And if we listen carefully, we realize that like Ezekiel's holy shepherd, judgment is once again not related to the things we might choose. Christ's judgment is not at all like the kinds of sorting and judging we do with each other and ourselves every single day. Though one would not know it, based on popular Christianity, certainly not Christian nationalism, in this passage we see again that divine judgment is not related to one's theology or political affiliations or even to one's profession of faith or lack of it. Both the sheep and the goats call Jesus Lord. Christ the King is not concentrating on those things as he does his sorting and his judging work. Furthermore, we don't even see the word sin in this entire picture of judgment. Rather, Matthew adds another layer to Brother Ezekiel's emphasis on holy insistence. Here in Matthew 25, God's holy insistence becomes more sharply focused on the use of holy imagination— In this passage, God insists on asking the question, did we live so imaginatively that when we saw the face of a weaker sheep in another or when we saw the face of a weaker sheep in ourselves, did we also see God's image in that face? Did we use the gift of holy imagination so that when we saw that person, perhaps one who's been butted around and battered about most of their life as a child of God, equal of value, a member of God's family, regardless of who they were or what they believed or didn't believe? And did we treat them as such? Or if we ourselves have been butted around and battered about most of our lives, did we see ourselves as worthy of God's love? Or did we fail to exercise the hard work of God's imagination? To paraphrase Fred Craddock, did you see the face of a child who didn't have a warm coat even though winter's coming and say, oh, how awful, but it's not my kid? Or did you look at a recent widower sitting by himself on the pew and say, that's sad, but it's not my dad. 
Or did you pass by someone in the throes of addiction or of mental illness sitting up against our courtyard gate and say, oh, that's a heartbreak, but it's not my mom or my brother or sister or friend? I would add, did we see the face of a Jewish hostage released this weekend or the face of a Palestinian still waiting at the border crossing and decide the whole thing is very painful, but it's also just too complicated to devote much attention to and promptly switch off the news? The judgment of Matthew 25 centers on God's holy insistence that we use God's remarkable gift of holy imagination, a gift of faith that allows us to see the image of God in each other and in ourselves regardless. This passage asks us to consider how we go about using that gift. Do we use it? Does it affect the decisions that we make, the causes in which we become involved? Do we live each day as a living embodiment of God's mercy and compassion for others and for ourselves? Or do we tend to give in to spiritual laziness, look out into the world and everything God has made and say, oh, I don't have the energy to care, I have enough on my plate It's not my problem. Do we lethargically conclude, I don't really see how I could do anything about it as we go back to our computers to get ready for Cyber Monday sales? Jonathan Kozal, the writer who's devoted most of his career to studying and writing about children in poverty, says he's now embarrassed to remember some of the ways by which he himself would talk about the need for better social safety nets. He says he used to march up to Capitol Hill in Washington and advocate for programs like Head Start. He would say things like, every dollar you invest in Head Start today will save the country six dollars later or lower prison costs. Kozal now confesses he's ashamed he ever phrased it that way with dollars and cents as the bottom line. Now he says, why not invested them just because they're babies. They deserve to have some joy in their lives before they die. To use our language, it sounds to me like Kozal wishes he had expressed God's insistence on holy imagination. By the way, it's interesting to note that both the sheep and the goats were surprised in this parable. No one expected King Jesus to go about the business of sorting and judging in the way he did. The goats sure didn't. They were completely surprised to learn that by actively ignoring or just kind of numbly overlooking the strangers, the sick, the imprisoned, they had indeed ignored and overlooked Christ himself. I'm sure they were thinking, if we had just known who these people were, we would have acted very differently even more interesting to me, though, is that even the sheep were surprised by the way King Jesus went about this sorting and judging business. Clearly, they were not going through their lives calculating their actions based on some notion of future reward. They were not trying to earn their way into eternal life or into God's love by what they did. They were just living, actively using their God-given holy imaginations, insisting on remembering and embodying God's holy insistence that all of our, of all are of value to God, for all are loved by God, and that God is the judge, not any of the sheep. One final note. We might want to notice that as soon as Jesus painted this picture for the crowd, this picture of God's holy insistence that all are valued because all are loved, this picture of God's holy insistence that all sheep use God's holy imagination, this picture that declares that the only one in charge of gathering and sorting is a holy shepherd, well, as soon as Jesus finished saying all of that out loud, people in positions of power started plotting. The people who were offended that God was stepping onto their turf of judgment 
began crafting the plans for his arrest and execution. Jesus is preaching on God's holy insistence and the call to live with holy imagination, agitated the powers that be so much, they began the construction of his cross. So make no mistake about it, baptismal living with holy insistence and holy imagination can be dangerous. It will cost you something. But in a world in which reign of Christ Sunday continues to be a needed reminder, and people continue to be butted around and battered about, judged and sorted at human will, it is also what will undoubtedly give us the fullness of life that God intends for all. So may it be so. Amen. Friends, we have heard the word proclaimed. We have heard it sung. Now let, let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed printed in the bulletin. Church, what do you believe? 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Friends, there are many ways with our hands and our hearts and our minds to serve. And if you wish to contribute financially to the church, this is the time. Um, they'll also pass the friendship pads uh, along the pews. So please do, if you are a visitor, let us know that you're here so we can reach out. Let us pray. God, you are the source of every good and perfect gift. Use these tithes and offerings for your glory through the work of this church, through its ministries, through its people, 
which are weaving a tapestry of love and action that we call community. To you, we dedicate our lives, and these are our offerings. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, we offer thanks for the joy that overflows when we think of the ones that we love, for all the gifts you grant to us that are easy to see, and for those you give that are disguised, for all the blessings we recognize, and for those we fail to notice, God, hear our prayers of gratitude. In the quiet of these moments, we turn to you hoping to sense, to speak into our lives words of loves, love and forgiveness, of meaning and grace, that you would recenter our lives in the things that are important in this life. We pray for our community, for those we love, and for those who we have lost, for neighbors near and far. We pray for our city and our state and our country and our world as we grapple with the loss and mourn the passing of Rosalind Carter, a great advocate for the marginalized and one of your beloved children. God, our thoughts wander to those of us whose problems weigh heavily on our hearts today. We live in a world that is filled with fear and chaos and violence, and often it overtakes the beauty of our lives. We find ourselves shrinking in anxiety, yet we believe that you are the one who calls us to stand up for what is good and what is right. Help us to manage our fears so that we might continue to do your slow work, the work you have called us to. So today, God, from sunrise to sunset, remind us again and again of your holy presence hovering in and around us. Free us from shame, free us from self-doubt. We pray that you make us instruments of your love, agents of your justice and peace. Strengthen us to work for unity and harmony between people of every nation, every race, every color, and every creed. Enable us to respect all of your children and to love one another as ourselves that we may serve one another in humility, simplicity, and joy. God of love, hear our prayer and always help us lean into you and rest in the deep knowing that your grace is enough for us and we are enough for your grace. Praying the prayer that you taught us, saying, Beloved parent who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
all you sheep. Go out into this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you. May God be gracious and give you peace forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs>